Okay, everyone, welcome. And I would like to introduce Dr. Jeff Schlado, who is the director of the UC Davis Tahoe Environmental Research Center. Uh, you may notice he has a funny accent. You can try to guess where it's from. <laughs> All right, Jeff, thanks for joining and being on time. Okay, thank you, Heather. Thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, it's it's late. It's uh, three o'clock, so you, you're probably all a little weary. Um, so we're going to make uh, just two pop quizzes during this today to allow you not to be too burnt out. Um, but no, seriously, no quizzes. Um, there is going to be a lot of information, and it's not really meant to be to test you. It's just to give you an idea of, or a sense of what we what we do, uh, and I'm sure you know what you've been doing and um, till now has prepared you. Some of you are very familiar with us. Some of you have read about us. Uh, the idea is to try to better equip you to describe us and also just satisfy any questions you have. I would be really happy to answer questions as we go. Um, this is very free form. Um, and so don't worry that you're interrupting my train of thought because my train of thought is does not run on rails. It goes every which way. Um, okay, so whoops. So I always start this uh, presentation by welcoming you all to the University of California at Davis. And really, if you do go on and decide to be a, a docent, then you are joining, joining our family um, in, in, in every way. The University of California is, is an exceptional institution. Um, you can see on the, on the map here to the left, you know, the main campus is, um, is in Davis. But the university considers that it has three other satellites. Uh, one is the Bodega Marine Lab on the coast of Bodega Bay. The other is the UC Davis Health System in Sacramento. So we're not some little lab in some hidden building. That's what we used to be. Um, but we are really a prominent uh, part of the university. Actually, if you go on the university's webpage, um, and hit to the about button um, and scroll down to the bottom or near the bottom, you actually see a, a feature about, about us and our role within the university. Okay, so something like you know, we're, we're considered our one university, meaning we are a research university in the top tier. Um, we have something like 35,000 students, 100 majors. Uh, I don't know why they put the number of bicycles there. Uh, very diverse in by whatever metric you use. Uh, this slide was from a few years ago when our research funding was something like $700 million. This year, and this year ends for us anyway, uh, June 30th, uh, we're, we're going to in all likelihood exceed $1 billion in research funds. That's the university. That's not Tuck. Uh, but we are... Um, we are contributors to that. We have something we bring in, we expend you know, several million dollars in research every year. Okay, I'm not sure what you've covered in, in the training thus far, so I will just uh, fly over this very quickly. Uh, some people say we were discovered by John Fremont. Um, in 1844, of course, the lake was here long before John Fremont was. Um, but that was the first time it was supposedly viewed by Europeans. Um, the lake itself is probably something like 2 million years old. So you've uh, no doubt heard tell that it's 500 meters deep or about 1,645 feet deep. As deep as that water is, there's probably double that depth of sediment under the lake. And so that depth of sediment, if we were able to go down and take a sample of it, a core would be something like 3,200 feet deep, three kilometers, you know, almost two miles. It's, yeah, it's, I, I see Steve, Steve McQuinn 
putting his head back. That's really hard to imagine. A, a sediment core two miles in length, but from the top of that core to the bottom, we have a history of the Western United States over the last two million years. So imagine the, the story that could tell if we were ever able to, uh, to get such a sediment. Other lakes in the US, Lake Superior, all the Great Lakes, um, nearly all of them were glaciated. So 10,000 years ago, they weren't lakes, they were parts of uh, rivers of ice and all their sediments were scoured. So if we take cores in those lakes, we can go back 10,000 years, a really, a really short history um, of, of, uh, of this land. Uh, so we always think of Lake Tahoe as, um, as just being its own entity. Well, it is. Here it is on the left, right on the, um, the dog leg of the border between California and Nevada. But it's really the top of a much bigger watershed. So uh, here's Lake Tahoe. This is its watershed. Water flows out of the Truckee River through Truckee down to Reno and Sparks and ultimately on to Pyramid Lake, which is on uh, the Paiute Nation Reservation. It used to be uh, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, that Pyramid Lake would, would occasionally overflow into the Great Basin. So Lake Winnemucca, shown here, would periodically get water. But because of diversions, so this diversion shown here, water is removed from uh, um, from the Truckee River and sent across to Fallon for agriculture. So that activities like that really change lakes and and the hydrology of the entire region. Uh, okay, so this is the lake. The yellow the yellow line there shows the edge of the uh, of the watershed. Uh, these are statistics you've probably seen. I'm not going to dwell on them. We we often say we're the 11th deepest lake in the world, but ever since we started saying that, people have said, well, what about this lake? What about that lake? Uh, you can argue about whether a lake under the ice in Antarctica, permanently under ice, should be counted amongst the deepest lakes in the world. Without getting into the semantics of that, they're somewhere between the 11th and the 16th lake, deepest lake in the world, depending how you, you want to count it. Uh, its surface area, 500 square kilometers, within a watershed, a land area of about 800 square kilometers. So that's uh, part of the reason why, why the lake is clear is it has a small watershed that water flows through on its way to the lake. And most of that watershed is undeveloped. It's, it's forested land uh, and in reasonably good condition. We use this term, the mean residence time is 650 years. It's a very simple, but a bizarre concept nonetheless. It just means if you were to drain all the water out of the lake, it would take 650 years to refill if, the, if we had our, our mean precipitation. So by contrast, most lakes, most reservoirs would have a residence time, anything from a few months to maybe six or seven years. So most water, most lakes, water goes through it much, much faster than it does at Tahoe. Okay, so how do lakes work? Hey Jeff, uh, sorry yes. for the interruption. You said you said we could interrupt. Uh, back on the previous slide, the yellow line indicating the watershed, is that more or less the Tahoe Rim Trail as well? Yeah, more or less. Okay. Um, yeah, if, you, if, if the Rim Trail was right at that peak, yes, um, but it's, it's not quite at that peak, but it's a rough approximation to it. Okay, thanks. Okay, so lakes are, are complex, um, but in many ways, they're also quite simple. Simple in that the factors that drive them, I think can be readily understood. The principal ones can be, but every lake is different. That's the complexity. They're all on different soils. They all have different land uses. 
Um, and, and yeah, the food webs are different. So we're going to go through what I consider to be the most important feature of a lake. Um, and what that is dictated by is temperature. So the lake temperature, even though it's um, just a, a relatively simple variable, um, by knowing the temperature distribution in the lake, we can know so much about how the lake responds and even things like it's um, how its food run uh, would change. And we can, we can talk about that later. So what I'm showing now is uh, Lake Tahoe, the top 200 meters. Remember, it's 500 meters deep. So this is just, just the upper part of it. But this is where many of the changes occur. So this red squiggly line represents real data, real measurements of the lake temperature. Uh, and, you, and this is taken in winter. So in March, March is when the lake is at its coldest and usually when it's, it's the most well mixed, meaning it's losing heat at the top, that water at the top is getting cold and dense and it just falls down and mixes the lake below it. All right. Um, if we go out again a couple of months later, May, we start, we see that the bottom temperatures down here are more or less the same, four and a half degrees, almost five degrees, but something's happening at the surface. What's happening is that it's starting to warm up. It's spring, it's getting warmer. The days are longer. Light, light from the sun um, is shining on the lake and that warms the surface. Light, as you all know, um, if you've thought about it, can penetrate through water. And you say, well, how do we know that? Well, if you've ever walked into Lake Tahoe or a swimming pool or a bathtub and looked down and seen your feet, then what you're seeing is light penetrating through water. Other things like evaporation, which is a major loss of heat, that only affects the very surface. So light, what we often call shortwave radiation, is important because it can penetrate and it can warm with depth but it doesn't go all the way to the bottom. It uh, gets scattered and absorbed by, molecules, by dust molecules and things like that. So like you've no doubt heard about the Secchi depth. In a way, that Secchi disk, when we put it over the boat and look at it, it's a measure of how far down light is penetrating. So if the Secchi depth is 70 feet, what it means is that light from the sky has gone down 70 feet, bounced off the Secchi disc, and gone back up again 70 feet and into our, into our eyes. All right, so it's gotten a little bit warmer. I just have to look at my screen. It's about nine, it's about nine degrees here in May. Uh, and now we've gone forward to July, and it's gotten even warmer yet, almost 16 degrees Celsius. That's what, 64 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so this is actually a good point to pause. So what, what are we seeing here? Still cold water down here, warm water at the top, and this region in between where we have a very rapidly changing temperature profile. Uh, we call that the thermocline. Is that an important word to remember? Not at all. Uh, you go to a party and you start talking about a thermocline, you will see people people leave your vicinity very quickly. Um, but it's important for, for, for the leak. Um, it, it separates this warm region, which is dense, oh, sorry, which is light, its density is very low, from this colder, more dense region. So the separation between the dense water and the light water is very sharp, relatively speaking. Light water on top of heavy water means that they're not inclined to mix in a way you can think of it as oil on water. Um, so, th so this water is starting to behave very differently than that water. Okay, we keep going. We're in September. It's gotten even warmer. Nothing too much to say about this other than one small detail. So if we look at this progression from May through July through September, 
what we see is this very surface part here is quite shallow. Maybe it's like five or six meters. Here, it's maybe more like 10, 12 meters. Here, it's getting 15 or 20 meters. So what we're seeing is that top layer of the lake is starting to get uniform. And if I show you the next period, we see it's gotten even more uniform, and now it's starting to cool. So what we're seeing is the seasonal progression as we go from May to July to September and back to November. So as we go into the fall, it's cooling, but it's also mixing. As I said, it's getting cold at the top and that water is heavier. And so it's mixing down. If we could uh, imagine what would happen two months later, hopefully you're all thinking, oh, it's going to get even cooler and maybe mix even deeper. Let's see if you are right. Yes, you are. So it's actually gone to here, where it's pretty much almost uniformly mixed. There's a bit of a kink there. So really what we have here, this is the annual cycle of Lake Tar. That's the annual cycle of most lakes. Um, I'm not showing you all the way to the bottom here because, well, I don't know why I'm not, but um, if I was, you would probably see that the very bottom of the lake is even a little bit cooler than, than what we're showing here. So Lake Tahoe, because it's so deep, doesn't always mix to the very bottom. And that's one of the concerns about Lake Tahoe is that currently it mixes to the bottom every four or five years. With climate change, we're worried that um, maybe that will become longer every eight years, every 10 years, every 30 years. Uh, we're not sure. We have models to explore that that we're currently working on. Why is it important that we have this mixing? This is for every lake, for every reservoir. This is a process like, like spring cleaning, except it's not spring, it's winter. Um, what we're doing is we're kind of bringing water down and refreshing the bottom of the lake. If you think of the bottom of the lake, 200 meters or 500 meters, that water hasn't been in touch with the surface. It's very dense. Before we had light water there, everything that's in the lake, dead fish, algae, people's lunch that they throw off the side of a boat, it all ends up at the bottom of the lake where it consumes oxygen, decomposes. And so without this annual mixing, there's no new oxygen getting to the bottom of the lake. So this is a really important process. Uh, are, Tahoe has relatively little algae, so oxygen stays reasonably high throughout the year. But there are other lakes um, throughout the Sierra, throughout the foothills, throughout the country, where they have a lot of algae, a lot of biological matter, and that lake loses all its oxygen at the bottom. Uh, and that's a serious issue it's for fish life, for the chemistry of the sediments, things that well, I'm not going to necessarily go into right now. Okay, um, moving on. So what I just showed you was a series of profiles. If we were to string all those together and now show just the upper 100 meters of the lake um, against time here, this is, this is the picture you get. So we have in the winter, January, February, March is when it's cold and pretty uniform. As we approach spring, it starts to warm. We call that, it stratifies. It gets probably at its warmest at this time, which is usually around August at Tahoe. And then you can start to see how these colors are deepening. So this is the deepening, 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 as we get to the end of the year. All right, got to move on. So that's the stratified period, the unstratified period. All right, let's talk about clarity. Um, yeah, this is one of the saddest stories in history. Um, this is Father Angelo Secchi. He was the father of astrophysics. Those of you who have heard about um, radio astronomy 
may know that he was the inventor of radio astronomy. Uh, not many people know that, but rather they associate his name with this stinking little brown disc. Um, so yeah, you invent radio astronomy and you get a, a white disc named after you. So I think that's very unfair, um, but that's what it is. Uh, as I said before, this is a really convenient device for getting a simple estimate of how far down you can see into the water. It, it's the cheapest instrument we have. It doesn't, its batteries are always fully charged. It doesn't require factory calibration. It never breaks. Um, and when you tell people the Seki depth was 20 meters or 66 feet, that means something to them. So it's wonderful. It's also probably the most common measurement taken in all lakes. So it's, it's a way of comparing different kinds of lakes very readily, as opposed to measurements from different instruments that may have lasers of different wavelengths that you are using to measure water clarity. So it's a, it's a wonderful instrument, poor old Father Secchi. Um, so here are some, actually, this, this is the latest data. This data has not been publicly released. So please do not take any screenshots and, and send this out to all your friends because this is about a week off being released. So this is the annual average Secchi depth. Uh, through 2021. So each of these white um, symbols represents the average of about 25 values we take every year. And what you see is the story of Lake Tahoe. Back in the day, we could see down 30 meters, about 100 feet, uh, and it has declined since that time, despite a lot of effort, a lot of science, a lot of good intention. It has it hasn't gone back to what everybody wants it to go back to. Uh, this decline hasn't been uniform. So you see here in the, uh, in the 90s, late 90s, there was a period of improving clarity for about seven or eight years. And then there was a period of about 10 years when it was going down again, and then it was improving. So the reasons for the decline are, are manifold. Uh, and they're influenced by year-to-year -year variations, which is what we're seeing here. Uh, one, one way we've been looking at this you know, in the last um, few years is trying to break things apart into summer and winter. So this is for, just for the summer months, which uh, we define as, I think it's Ju June through August, something like that. And it doesn't matter. For the summer months, you actually see there is a pretty continuous decline. It's linear. I mean, again, lots of interannual variability, but it's all downhill, even though that looks like it's uphill. It's downhill. If we look at winter, so that's December through March, we see that, yeah, it was getting worse, but here around 2000, it seems to be getting better. And the only reason you think it's getting better is that this line, or this curve, this arc we put here is indicating it's improving. Actually, that's a trick. Um, well, it's not really a trick. Um, it's just the nature of this curve we put through there. If we were to remove that curve and actually look at the last 20 years of data, there's actually no statistical trend to show that clarity is improving in the last 20 years. Um, so the bottom line, be it annual, be it summer or winter, things aren't getting better. In winter, they're not getting worse, but they're not getting better. Some of they're continuing to get worse. And that's, a, that's an issue for us and for, um, I think, well, for all of us, really, because we all, we're all working towards getting clarity um, back to 100 feet. So each of those symbols I told you was the clarity um, averaged over a year. And what I'm showing you here are three different years, 2018, 19, and 20, showing the individual 
clarity readings. And what you let's just focus on this one, this intermediate blue one, which is 2019. And what you see is that it varies a lot during the year. Typically, the highest clarities occur in winter. So here you can see it's like it's 110 feet. So if we want to make people to feel good, we would just take one reading a year, maybe in February or March, and say it's 100 feet, 99 feet, and everybody would feel good, but it wouldn't be representative at all. So here it's, it's very good. Something like uh, two or three weeks later, it's at 50 feet. So this is very, very dynamic. And the reason it's, it's so variable is in part because of what's in the water. So typically, spring, spring runoff is occurring in March and uh, sorry, in April and May and June. So the secchi depths tend to be lower at that point of year. Lots of fine particles are coming in, lots of algae. Sorry, lots of nutrients are coming in to stimulate algal growth. So typically things go down there. The reason things are often clearer in winter is of that deep mixing we were talking about a few minutes ago. The bottom of the lake is crystal clear. It's, yeah, you can see amazingly at the bottom of the oh, Not at the bottom of the lake. I haven't been there. But there are times when water from the bottom of the lake comes up to the surface. And when that happens, then the secchi depth is amazingly high. So here in uh, whatever month this was, fe late February in 2019, there was over 110 feet of clarity. In January this year, 2022, um, it was, I think, 133 feet. So, whoa, what's happening? How did that happen? Did all the algae disappear? No, they didn't. And that's what complicates this whole picture is that the lake is highly dynamic. The lake is always moving. So uh, just close your eyes for a minute and imagine the lake. And imagine the lake is stratified. So up and it's very cold and dense at the bottom. So now think of the wind blowing across the lake. Prevailing wind direction is from the southwest to the northeast. And so you've got this wind moving across the lake. What it does is it pushes that surface water over to, to um, Incline Village. Uh, so Incline Village gets nice warm waters to swim in, but as that water gets pushed away from the west shore, we can't have a hole in the lake, a hole in the surface. Water from the bottom comes up to take its place. So you think of this water in the lake as almost like a spring. The surface gets pushed one way and the bottom comes up to take its place. Bottom water, that cold, dense water that's brought up, is incredibly clear. So if our field crew goes out immediately after a very strong wind episode, by immediately, I mean the next day when it's safe, then what they're lowering the secchi depth through is literally bottom water that is temporarily at the surface. And that's why they get these incredibly high values. And that's why a few days later, it's back to what it was as it sinks back to the depths and the water from Incline Village goes back to Humboldt. And it's also the reason we never, well, we, we've been avoiding giving estimates of the secchi depth every time we take them, because in a way it's, it's information, it's data, but it doesn't really help many people's understanding. If we were to report this really clear value, everybody would be high-fiving and saying, it's, you know, we've done it. If we were to show, tell them it's only 38 feet, then everybody would be depressed. It's, it's really a longer term average. And even a one year average is, is quite short. Okay, moving on. Hey, Jeff, where, uh, and I apologize if I missed this, where are the, are, are the measurements taken at the same place all the time? And if so, can you tell us where? Um, yeah, I can. Um, actually, let me just fly back to a map. Hmm. 
So the, the, most of the measurements are taken here in about 100 meters of water um, off Homewood. Uh, we do that about every 10 days, every 14 days. Oop, there's my cursor gone there. And then we also take measurements every month at a mid lake point here, uh, actually near the state line. Uh, because we take more there, we, we, we generally average these for the annual average. Uh, but when you compare the two, they're almost, they're very close to being identical, certainly within the statistically the same. So but we do this because it's convenient to where we are. Um, Thank you. Okay, uh, very quickly, what causes clarity decline? Um, so I said light is absorbed and scattered by the water itself, but also between inorganic particles like dust and, and very fine algae. It turns out that when I said fine particles, less than 20 microns, and I have here really less than eight microns, but I should have another parenthesis there that says really, really less than about five or six microns. So it's only those very small ones, less than about five or six microns, but bigger than one micron. I mean, they're, yeah, they're almost invisible, that scatter light. Um, and that has to do with the wavelength of light. So yeah, if sand gets washed into the lake, sure, and water looks cloudy for about 10 minutes or two hours, but it settles out. Um, so it's these fine particles. Where do they come from? Uh, most of them, this is based on what work we did about 20 years ago. Most of them come from the urban areas around the lake. So it's about 20% of, of the land. So this is the land we've disturbed. This is the land we've paved over, so it's impervious. And so instead of water running across the surface and then being intercepted by plants and then becoming part of the soil fabric, it just runs quickly over asphalt and concrete, goes to culverts, goes to drains, and ends up in the lake. So this is the reason these lands are the problem lands. This green area, non-urban upland. So it's responsible for 90% atmospheric deposition. Dust and smoke can, well, actually we'll come back to smoke in a second. Mainly dust. Um, that's maybe 15%. So that's what adds particles to the lake. I mentioned smoke before. You know, those of you who have been in the basin the last few years, you, you thought you knew what smoke was before. Um, but last year and even the year before, it was pretty bad. Um, atmospheric deposition during those events was just off the charts. So fine particles and nutrients brought in by atmospheric deposition was, were just some of the largest loads to the lake in the last two years. Okay, so this is just some photos of, of this urban area contributing fine particles. So here's a, a culvert coming in from an urban area. This is what you may have all seen this water just flowing across a, a parking lot. Um, so I keep talking in microns. Some of you probably are really clear how big a micron or four microns is. Well, let me help you. So um, a dog, if you have a dog, your dog is about a million microns long. Uh, if it has fleas, there are about 3,000 microns. Head of a pin, 2,000. Your hair is about 100 microns in diameter. If you have ever changed the toner of a photocopy or a printer and gotten what looks like black ink on your, on your hands, that's actually just a fine particles that are about 10 microns in diameter. And E. coli bacteria are about one micron. So we're sort of the stuff that affects clarity in water is somewhere in that range. And this is a, a graph showing uh, the particle size of road dust. Um, and you can see it ranges you know, from about you know, this one to 10 microns. Um, so it's very fine stuff. And drive on the shoulder of the road and the dust blows up behind you. 
that gets lofted into the air and as it drifts around, if it lands on the lake, you are contributing to fine particles in the lake. Most algae are much bigger than that range. So most algae don't have a, a large impact on the clarity. And this was something that was a misconception that existed up to about 2000, where it was thought that algae and nutrients were the biggest cause of clarity decline. But some algae are smaller. So this is uh, one particular one called Cyclotella. It's what's known as a diatom. It's a little silicon frustule or skeleton. Uh, and it's a couple of two, three microns across. We have had these in the lake from about the mid-1960s. And they have been one of the, one of the major, they along with like dust, have been the major drivers of clarity decline. Okay, how am I doing on time here? Okay. Okay. Um, okay, let me tell you a story now. Um, and let's start with a, a little video. All right, here we go. We're down, we're at the bottom of... Um, near Emerald Bay, we're about 70, 80 meters down into the lake. And we have a little circus going on here. There are lots of animals and they're all swimming around. Anybody know what they are? Come on, shout it out if you know. Mice shrimp. Mice shrimp, exactly. So look at these guys, they're, they're everywhere. And they have those big giant eyes. It seems to have gone a little bit blurry now. Um, but anyway, this is, uh, this is down in the middle of the day, but down there at um, 70 or 80 meters, it's dark. Uh, and the only reason we can see is that this remotely operated vehicle has really bright lights. Whoop. Okay. So something very bizarre happened back in 2010. Um, actually, no, let, let me go back before that. Um, something not so bizarre, actually, something that's very uh, usual for our species uh, happened. Um, and that is we messed with the system. Uh, so in the 1960s, the fisheries department of both California and Nevada introduced the mysa shrimp. This guy, what you just saw in that video, introduced it to Lake Tahoe. Why did they do that? They did so because they thought they were doing the right thing. And it turned out that there was a lake in Canada where these had been introduced and anglers there started catching record fish. It was great. And anglers, fishermen, fisher people, being what they are, they all wanted to catch record fish. And so the state uh, fish and game departments were inundated with requests to put these magic shrimp everywhere. Uh, and they did it. And what happened at Tahu is we're now looking at graphs of the population of four of the zooplankton species. So zooplankton are little animals that naturally exist in the lake. So one of them is Daphnia. And so this graph starts in 67. This is a, around the time they introduced the mice and shrimp. So it took about two, uh, three or four years before the Daphnia population pretty much disappeared. There's another zooplankton called Bosmina did pretty much the same thing. And two other species, Epicura and Dioptimus, were pretty much unchanged. So this is the direct result of mysis coming in. Uh, what mysis do um, as part of their natural being is they don't like light. So during the day, when the sun's out and you know, sunlight penetrates in the lake, they go deep down in the lake where it's dark. And so trout, which are sight feeders, can't see them. Hmm. So 
during the day, the trout can't eat the mice and shrimp. At night, the mice and shrimp come up and do this incredible thousand foot migration. They come up, it's nighttime, the trout can't see them, but the mice can see the Daphnia and the Bosmina and they eat them. That result is the food that the trout and the native minnows and everything else was eating, eating was consumed by the mice and the fish got smaller. Now, you will say, well, what about that lake in Canada? What about the, the, the magic shrimp there? That lake was about 30 meters deep. It was a fraction of Tahoe's depth. So the shrimp did the same thing. It went down to the bottom during the daylight, but the trout could still see them. So they could be feeding on them. It worked there. In Tahoe, it didn't work. And our food web has been permanently changed. And that was the case in most Western lakes where they were introduced. Flathead Lake in, in, um, where is, in Montana uh, totally had its, uh, its food web changed. Okay. Now, this is the exciting part. That's the history. So Emerald Bay, 2011 to 2017, we went out. Um, I mean, I should say, I mean, people have looked at mysis, ourselves included, periodically over time. You know, once they got established in the 60s and 70s, it was interesting. By the 80s, it was boring, uh, and nobody really sampled them or looked at them very much. Um, uh, back in 2011, 2012, we were curious. We said, let's just take a check on the mysis. Went out to Emerald Bay. Actually, went to Tahoe as well. But in Emerald Bay, what we saw when they went out these, whatever, every three months for about a year and a half, is the mysis numbers were low. They should have been up here, but suddenly they gone. Sorry, that's the that would be the average about a hundred in Emerald Bay for mice. So this is uh, this was unusual based on the episodic sampling that had been done the previous forty or fifty years. Daphnia, which I just told you, had disappeared at the beginning, a very low, um, and suddenly their numbers are going up when we sample them every every three months. Well, that's curious. Uh, this dashed line, this was their long-term average there, like nothing. Was my, uh, uh, the Seki depth. This is what we saw with the Seki depth over this period. So it went from about, whatever that is, you know, 35 feet to 70 feet in something like two years. Uh, during this time, actually, the Seki depth of Tahoe was, was actually worse than this. Seki depth of Tahoe was about 65 feet. So we're getting clearer values in Emerald Bay than at Tahoe. And all that's happened is the mysis have gone, the Daphnia have come back. Okay, and that's, the, that's what the usual Seki depth is in Emerald Bay. Just kept measuring for the next few years. Eventually, the mice came back. Because the mice are back, they did their old trick on the Daphnia. They disappeared and boom, they're gone. And the Seki depth went back to what it was. So this is a, a new take on clarity. I mean, you know, we all think a development occurred at Lake Tahoe in the 60s, with people and land clearing and impervious surfaces. And no doubt, that is a part of the story. But at the exact same time, mice were introduced and they were removing Daphnia. And Daphnia have this, their, their way of eating is literally shoveling it all in. Everything that fits in their, their mouthpiece they eat, and that includes fine particles, inorganic um, uh, dust. It's not that they grow from eating dust, but they consume it and it gets 
packaged in their feces and it gets excreted. And because it's now a big fecal pellet, it quickly drops to the bottom of the lake and it's removed from the system. So in a way, the Daphnia were the cleaners of the lake. And by introducing mysis, we removed the, our cleaning service, which meant we had to do an even better job on stopping particles getting into the lake. And the fact that clarity has not returned means despite our best intentions and lots of money, we haven't done a good enough job in achieving that. Okay, um, so just to show this by way of cartoons, this was the old Lake Tahoe dominated by Daphnia and it would consume little brown dust particles that were always coming in, tiny little diatoms, and it couldn't eat these big algae. So these big algae were there, but look at the size of that, it's not gonna feed in fit into its mouth. So it was just eating these things. Um, Post-1963, mysis came in. So not scary. Took care of the Daphnia. These things could also eat the big algae. So the big algae disappeared. And we have this proliferation of fine particles and very fine um, diatoms. Okay, so another way of looking at this is this is our uh, is the food web of Tahoe. We have the lake trout, um, and they do feed on mysis, um, but they used to feed on the daphnia, and they used to feed on the little fish that that ate the daphnia. Um, so that's this is all being broken now because we have a dominance of these, we're lose the, losing those more cyclotella, they're the small algae, more fine inorganic particles, and declining succulents. All right. How's everybody doing? Any questions? Uh, I have one. Yeah. Um, so if the daphnia are vanishing, how do the mysis? shrimp still stay uh, super populated if they're depending on the Daphnia? Yeah. Uh, good question. Um, I mean, the Daphnia uh, are still there, but they're basically being, as eaten, they're being eaten as quickly as they're reproducing. Um, they also eat some of those other uh, zooplankton, the Epichura and the Dioptimus. They're also cannibalistic. They're also, they, um, they eat garbage. I mean, they're at the bottom of the lake for half their life. So whatever falls down there, they'll eat. So they're, they're adaptable. Uh, their numbers are, are huge. Um, but yeah, they're managing to stay alive. And, and you know, we, we have a plan to remove, remove the mysis. Um, and the way this works is that I said that uh, every, every evening they come up in the lake. How far do they come up? They come up as far as the thermocline, that sharp division between the cold bottom waters and the warm surface waters. They come there because they don't like warm water and they kind of get trapped there, but everything gets trapped there. So that's where there are lots of zooplankton for them to eat. So they come there as a narrow band, maybe a band is 50 feet deep. Uh, and our plan was, well, if we know exactly where they are and we find them with bioacoustic instruments, then if we had a big enough net, maybe we could just cruise along at that depth and remove them. And we can. Uh, and what would we do with them? Well, we could take them to a landfill uh, if we like, but then we would just be stuck with the cost of removing them and dumping them. Or we could maybe upscale them, use them because they're full of omega-3 fatty acids and they have no contaminants in them. And we've been exploring with a group on, on the main campus and a private startup company using them in dog treats. Um, and they're nutritious, dogs love them. Um, 
but the work on developing that is still continuing. You do the financial analysis, it's pretty much a break-even proposition. So, yeah, it takes a lot of money, millions of dollars to remove the, the mysis, but if you get an equivalent amount of money by, by selling dog treats, then that's pretty cheap restoration, costing nothing. And of course, it's, um, it's amazing. For those of you who have dogs, you know how much money you spend on your, your dogs. Um, so enough said about that. Okay, uh, let's quickly talk about paraphyton. Maybe you've seen this. Uh, if you've lived around Tahoe and gone out on the slippery rocks at the shore, that's what paraphyton is. <clears throat> we have been measuring paraphyton for about 30 years. We have a number of routine sites that we do every month for about six months of the year. Also at their peak growing time, which is about March or April, we have about 50 sites where we try to measure them all as quickly as you know, within a couple of days. Um, what do they look like? These are the ones you've probably seen the most, these sort of little, little stalks, little stems on the rocks. Deeper down, we have green filamentous stuff. And even further down, six, seven, eight feet below, we have a, a blue-green algae. Um, that's much darker in color. Okay, the data. Oh my God, you're thinking, what is all this data? Um, let's just look at this top figure. And so what this is showing is ash-free dry mass. Another way of saying how much carbon is there. You know, this is the amount of, oops, the amount of paraphyton. This is showing our measurements since about 1980 up to 2020. If you look at this and say, well, is it going up? Is it going down? Statistically, it hasn't changed. We could also measure the chlorophyll, the pigment in these things. Once again, statistically, it hasn't changed. You ask Anybody at Lake Tahoe, what about this green slimy stuff on the rocks? They say, oh, it's getting worse every year. It isn't. Not, at least not by the measurements we've been take, taking. Um, and so why the disconnect? Well, we're not sure. One reason could be we started our measurements in the 1980s. Most of the development occurred before that time. Mysis were introduced before that time. Maybe back here in the 50s and 60s, there wasn't any. But nobody was there to measure. So if we would have started back then, maybe we would see a trend. Right now, there is no trend based on the data we have, which is a great argument for long-term data. Uh, just that ours wasn't long-term enough. Um, this is an even... Uh, actually, I'm going to skip over that. Um, I mean, actually, I'm going to skip over that too. I'm just going to jump to the conclusions because these are important. Um, so paraphyton, the biomass, has not increased, despite the fact that everybody thinks it has. Um, and the other, as part of the site selection that was done when the whole program started, there was sites located in developed areas and sites located in pristine areas. Um, and what we found is we get high concentrations regardless. It isn't just a matter of development. Like probably the biggest factor that changes how much is there is whether it's on the east shore or the west shore. Because of the prevailing winds, a lot of it that builds up on the east shore gets continually washed off by the waves. And so it appears less there, um, whereas the West Shore is, is more protected from the winds. All right. But, 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 uh, we have a new phenomenon, something called metaphyton. I'm sorry if these words are new to you. Um, I'm actually an engineer, so they're relatively new to me too. Um, so metaphyton, again, it's a form of algae, but it's different than the, the paraphyton that grows on the rock surface. Metaphyton are more 
filamentous strands of algae. So they're not free-floating algae that are invisible to our, you know, to the naked eye, but they form these long strands, a bit like seaweed, if, if you will, um, that aren't attached to the bottom. So we find it increasingly in the near shore regions of, of the lake. And this is something that has increased over time. Uh, so this is what the bottom of Lake Tahoe used to look like in, in many parts, and many parts of it still look like that. But other parts are starting to look like this. And this is a clump of, of metaphyton, and you see sort of smaller clumps there. But the other thing that's interspersed here are these shells. So these are Asian clam shells. So Asian clams, uh, Corbicula fluminea, was introduced in Tahoe probably about 20 years ago. Um, who knows how? Uh, well, maybe on a boat, maybe somebody dumping their, uh, their aquarium at the end of the summer. Um, but they're there. They're not nearly as, as obnoxious as, say, zebra mussels. It's a plant. It's not a mussel. So mussels build up on pipes and docks, and when you walk on them, they cut your feet. These are pretty in, seem pretty innocuous, and despite a lot of concern when they were first discovered, agencies have resisted treating them because it costs a lot of money and nobody's complaining too much. But what we've noticed is wherever we get these beds of clams, and they're predominantly on the south shore, but increasingly in the, in the north, we get metaphyton. So not time for another video. So this is a, an underwater view. And even here, you see the sandy bottom, and you see those very small, little small patches of, of metaphyton. But as we get closer to where the dead clam shells are on, on the surface, and even when you don't see the clam shells on the top, there are living clams underneath. Here, you're starting to see more and more of the metaphyton. Okay, so let's move on from that. So what have we been doing about it? Well, the first thing we've been doing about it is trying to find out where it is and when it is. So it's difficult with the periphyton. It's, uh, it doesn't move around. It's on a rock. Those, those boulders stay where they are. Uh, but the metaphyton, depending on the currents, depending on lake level, depending on the winds, a whole lot of things can move around. So we've been trying to get a sense of where it is, how it grows, uh, how it's moving using drones, using helicopters, uh, taking the imagery we get from these, georeferencing them, uh, using machine learning techniques to quantify um, how they're, they're changing. Uh, and the, yeah. So we're mapping the distribution, and I guess in the future we're looking to to use models. You talk about models right at the end for a couple of minutes. Uh, okay, so if you've been around the lake, especially in the last few years, but especially in the last few months, you're starting to, you can see the metaphyton. What we're seeing here, this is down on the South Shore, literally just four or five weeks ago. This is metaphyton washing up on the shore. Um, as the lake level falls, which it's starting to do now, there's going to be more and more of it um, appearing there and decomposing and smelling and the like. We're working with the League to Save Lake Tahoe to just as part of our citizen science program to arrange cleanups of this. One, because, well, we're all good neighbors. This is unsightly. Let's clean up our backyard. But also what we're doing in a way is every time we pick up some of this is we're removing nutrients from the lake. So let's think about it. I said that the Asian clams are coincident with this. What are the Asian clams doing? They're sucking huge amounts of water, they're sucking water. They're filtering out algae, which contain nutrients. They're using about 10% of that biomass for their growth. And then they're excreting the rest. Their excretion has about 
10 to 100 times the concentration of nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, than is in the ambient water. So suddenly, wherever you have the clams, you have very high nutrients. These Zygnema, Clodophora, these species of Metaphyton need high nutrient concentrations, and they're growing with it. So now these are packets of nutrients. Every pound of that we remove, some fraction of that is nutrients. So we're doing we're doing the analyses to figure out if somebody removes 20 pounds of dried metaphyton, how many grams of phosphorus have they removed? If another, enough people do it, maybe there are hundreds of pounds, maybe there are tons of, of nutrients removed. That's sort of something that will be coming out in the next few months. Uh, this is the other end of the lake. This is Tahoe City. This is the outlet um, of, this is or the beginning of the Truckee River. There's, <coughs> there's the dam. And you can see the same pretty ugly phenomenon. Um, part of it is paraphyton, but a large part of it is also metaphyton. Well, I said we, we use helicopter flights to to literally map the entire shoreline every month, as well as seeing metaphyton. So this is actually showing beautiful white beaches. This is the uh, this is the Hyatt at um, at Incline, but then we have I think in a third creek and Incline Creek coming in. We also get nice views of what the streams are bringing in. So in this case, it looks black and polluted and terrible. This is probably just dissolved organic matter that. It's probably a lot worse, looks a lot worse than it really is for the league. But it's a, it's a great perspective to have, to see the, the clear blue water here and then what's coming in. Uh, oh, God, how am I doing on time? Okay, I'm going to wrap up in five minutes. It's going to be really quick. Climate change. You are, well... Climate, the climate is changing. And there are so many ways we can see this at Tahoe. This is air temperature, nighttime temperature since 1910, up, 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 up. The snow, the snow is going down. 110 years ago, on average, 50% of the snow at lake level, sorry, 50% of the precipitation at lake level was snow. 110 years later, it's probably 35%. It's changed. Lots of interannual variability, but it's gone now. Surface temperature of the lake has gone up. Um, we're doing, we're working with climate change models uh, and taking the products from those climate change models to, to investigate how the lake is going to respond. So uh, this is some outputs from climate change models. This is showing air temperature. So this is the historical record from 1950 something to beginning of this century. Yeah, it's going up. Under a high carbon scenario, it's going to go up another eight degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century. If we're better stewards of the planet, it's going to go up less, but it's going to go up. Um, and it's more than just the lake water temperature going up. It changes that whole stratification business and the dynamics. And this is the last one I'll show you on climate change because it's really, it's scary. It's really scary. So this is, okay, strange, strange figure. This vertical axis, is the flow rate down the upper Truckee River. This is model data, by the way. So, so this is flow rate, and the horizontal axis is what's called the recurrence interval. What this means is, statistically, how frequently will a certain flow occur? So you've heard things like 50-year storm, 100-year storm. That's what this, you know, these numbers represent. So let's look at 100, the 100 year storm. So this blue, blue line represents the flow rate based on historical gauge data. 
Okay, so if I look here, the 100 year storm based on the data we have for the last, I think it's 25 years for Upper Truckee River, the 100 year flow is about 3,500 cubic feet per second. It's about right. Um, it doesn't mean we only get this once every 100 years, but it's a, it doesn't happen very often. All right, let's jump up to a high carbon future. Uh, and this red area represents sort of the, the range of about four different models. So somewhere in here, the models say our future lies. So let's be conservative. Let's choose a number somewhere in the middle of this red range. Uh, the 100 year storm up here is about 13,000 CFS. Remember, 3,500 to 13,000. If you've driven over those bridges on the South Shore, none of them are designed for 13,000 CFS. There's a lot of erosion, a lot of damage that will take place. Even scarier, though, is if we say our current 100-year storm with 3,500 CFS, in the future, how common of a storm will that be? That is to say, where is the 3,500 CFS flow rate in the future? And so we just go across to intercept that. It's like the five-year storm. So today's 100-year storm is our future five-year storm. We're going to get these big, big, we're going to get bigger flows than we've ever had, and we're going to get big flows even more often, more frequently. Okay, two slides. One slide and one animation. Ah, so models. Um, some of you in your professional lives may deal with, with models of different sorts. So what are models? Models are just mathematical representations of how well we understand the system. And so this is just a cartoon of a lake model. And the lake model, it represents this heat exchange, what causes the lake to stratify. It, it simulates the mixing that takes place at the top and at the bottom. But then if we really get you know, smart or ambitious, maybe, we can simulate the algae and how that changes dissolved oxygen and how nutrients are recycled. Lots of things you can do with a model. And we're trying to do it all. And it's it's a, it's a it's always a work in progress. Models are getting better. And through the models, we better understand the system. We understand what we don't know. Okay. So I'm just going to give you one result from the model we're currently working on. So that, as you know, this is Lake Tahoe. What I'm going to show you is uh, what happens to a river inflow that we release from the vicinity of Blackwood Creek here on the West Shore. So you get to see, so this is starting off in, uh, I guess, um, April 13th, 2018, and you'll see time advancing very quickly. Every day will be a, a second. Um, and so we're gonna release like a color tracer here, and you'll see where it goes in the lake. All right, here we go. So there it comes. And uh, so yeah, it's less than a, a day every second. So you're seeing it gets moved around down the shore. This is due to the Earth's rotation. It's taking it down this way. But you see that inflow very rapidly gets to potentially every part of, of the lake. So even though it looks like little Blackwood Creek isn't doing very much, it's having an effect. And there are 62 other streams that are having their own effect. Um, okay, so that's, that's it. Um, I wanted to thank you, um, those of you who are docents, those of you who have been docents, and those of you who may be docents, to thank you. Uh, if you are still thinking about it, continue to think about it, um, and maybe you will you will join us because we really could not fulfill our mission without you. 
Uh, and I realize this is a very demeaning picture. It makes you all look like you're the, the same little things. But it didn't mean that to me. I always, it seemed funny at the time when I put it there, but it's, it's not funny, is it? Okay, um, any more, any questions? And this maybe Heather could come online and maybe moderate or, how was that, Heather? Heather? Heather is who I answer to, so I gotta wow. see how I did. I was just gonna say that the, the faces could be the faces of the happy visitors who have come into contact with our docents. I think that's what you meant. That's exactly <laughs> what I meant, Allison. I don't know how I forgot that. <laughs> exactly. All right, George has a question. Yeah, I'm wondering about uh, <clears throat> the effect that uh, mixing events has on the clarity of the lake since you're, uh, you're pulling oxygen you know from the surface down toward the bottom um what is the relationship between those um yeah that, that that's a great question uh i one of my students who's working on on this tahoe model sergio valbuena that's exactly the question he is looking at right now we actually have um, oxygen sensors at the bottom of the lake at two locations, and he's he's looking at all the episodes that we've recorded over time, pre pre a mixing event and post mixing event, to see how has oxygen changed, um, and we call these upwelling events. And what he's finding is that they all result in an increase in bottom oxygen. It's not very large. It may be, if you think that, say, the maximum oxygen, the maximum dissolved oxygen concentration in the lake is about 10 or 12 milligrams per liter. So during one such event, he may see the bottom oxygen maybe go up 0.1 of a milligram. It's pretty small. But there are probably 20 or so of these events every year. So you know, 20 times 0.1 is two milligrams per liter. That's like 20% of the, the lake's oxygen. So it's real. I mean, it's having this real effect. If the lake got more strongly stratified due to climate change and that process became less efficient, then there may be a problem. And that's why we're developing models to try to simulate what would happen. Do we need to should we be worried about that or our worries well founded? So yeah, the mixing has an effect on oxygen. Does it have an effect on the clarity? Well, when that bottom water comes up, it has this short-term effect on clarity, but then clarity is affected by many things. So, it's so Brooke has a question for you, Jeff. Yeah. Hi, so my question um, is pretty broad, <laughs> but um, what is the importance of clarity itself um, for the ecosystem and also for other stakeholders like landowners? Like what, what is the broad takeaway with um, making sure that the lake is clear? Sure, many, many answers to that. Um, one of them is we like it clear. Um, and more importantly, everybody likes it clear. And you'll say, well, that's just aesthetic. And why does that matter? Well, it matters because we have a $3 billion tourist industry. And if it was not clear, if there were metaphyton everywhere, then a lot of those tourists that drive that would go elsewhere. They go to Hawaii, Australia, um, you know, a cool place like that. Um, so that's one thing. Um, from the point of view of human health, right now, Lake Tahoe has what's called a, what is it called? A, a non-filtration allowance, which means drinking water that's taken out of the lake doesn't have to be filtered. It has to be chlorinated, um, but it's not filtered. So having that means that you're... Um, it's a lot cheaper to process, uh, to, treat, to treat drinking water. So that's a, an economic benefit, but it's also reflective that the, the health conditions of the water uh, are good. We talked about light being penetrated by penetrating into water. 
What also penetrates is UV radiation. And UV radiation is really important for, for killing things, uh, for killing invasive species, for example. So it's sort of interesting that back, back in the day when Tahu had very high clarity, we actually had very few, if any, invasive species that weren't deliberately introduced. It's only been in the last 20 or so years, as clarity has gone down, that things like goldfish can reproduce in the lake. Part of the reason for that is that it's the native fish that can withstand the very high UV levels we have at the lake. Um, but as the water clarity goes down, the penetration of UV radiation goes down. And so goldfish, uh, bluegill, and lots of these other species can reproduce. And there's one thing to say, oh, I, you know, I released a goldfish into the lake, but it can't reproduce because the radiation will kill its, its, its young, even though it doesn't affect the adult. That would be fine because people are always going to be dropping goldfish in the lake. If we can get the clarity high enough, the UV penetration high enough, then in a way what we have is, uh, is a built-in treatment. They're using UV banks of UV lights to, to kill plants and the like. We don't need those if we have a clear leak. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. You know what that engineering thing? The I was. Yeah, right. that was me at the happy hour in, yeah. in Sacramento. Yeah, I was don't there. Tell them, don't tell them we were at happy hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, anybody else? Looking for hands raising or any other questions? Oh, George. Oh, you're, you're on mute, George. Still. One other quick question. Um, you had mentioned that, uh, that the lake trout are uh, able to feed on mysis. And I was wondering how that could happen given that I'm assuming lake trout are site feeders. Um, uh, just could you explain how, that, how that's possible? Um, I'm not sure. Um, uh, and the thing is they don't really enjoy it or relish it because they're pretty aggressive and they got big teeth and even a mysis which is maybe the size of your fingernail is that's a lot of work for for a tiny little shrimp so i think a lot of that feeding is somewhat accidental um but if you ask the professional fishermen when they clean fish and look at their stomach contents there are there are mice there, and they're the ones who have voiced questions about you know this let's call it plan to to um, to remove mice as well. What's it going to do to the to the lake uh, to the yeah to the lake trout? They're worried about their their business drying up. So we have said, well, there'll be Daphnia. Daphnia will feed the little minnows and it's a lot more efficient for a lake trout to eat minnows than, than zooplankton of any size. And they get it. They don't necessarily believe it yet, but what we're doing with them is when they go out, taking people on fishing trips and cleaning their fish, they're putting the, the fish guts um, in bags and freezing them and sending them to us. So we have freezers full of fish guts. <laughs> <laughs> with the idea that at some point we'll find some uh, summer interns or some students who really want, who are desperate, desperate enough to count uh, the contents of, of fish guts. Uh, and because we really want to know that work was done decades ago, but it's, it's changed. Um, and so we, if particularly if we can start a trial for mysis removal in Emerald Bay, we want to measure how, how the fish respond. There's lots of anecdotal information from you know, when they disappeared back in 2011, 12, 13. You know, anecdotal information and photos of, of kokanee that were caught at Emerald Bay that were double, triple the size of kokanee that are caught these days. I mean, now they're skinny little 12-inch things. They were great big 
rounded jaws. They would get two and three pounds at around Emerald Bay. So we think, well, I guess your question was, how do they eat mice? With great difficulty, but they do because they're hungry, but they would grow faster and probably be a lot happier eating small fish, um, which is what the Daphnia will feed very efficiently. Okay, any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much, Jeff. I'm just gonna do a wrap up for tomorrow, um, a quick view of tomorrow's agenda. So we appreciate your time if you need to hop off. I, I do, really nice uh, seeing you all and hopefully we'll see you all again.